Thomas Merton, uh, one of the greatest spiritual writers of the 20th century, wrote, if you want to identify me, ask me not where I live or what I like to eat or how I comb my hair, but ask me what I think I am living for. And ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully for the thing I want to live for. Some of us spent the weekend in this very room at a transforming trauma retreat. Actually, quite a few of us. How many in this room were at that retreat? Probably almost half. Um, the, the retreat was led by James Finley, who's a mystic and a, a trauma expert. And it just so happens that even though he didn't mention that the quote that I just read, um, just so happens he spent six years in the monastery with Thomas Merton, and he was blessed in that Thomas Merton was his novice master. So he learned a lot from Thomas Merton. But anyway, Finley told a story about uh, when he was training to be a psychotherapist. He was in a treatment center, an inpatient treatment center, and he told this story about how, um, you guys can mouth, word, mouth along with me, those of you who are at the <laughs> retreat. But he told this story about how um, it, the newcomer, the, the, the people who had been in the treatment for longer, would ask the newcomer, um, what do you love more than anything? And the newcomer said, I love my wife more than anything. And in unison, the other members of the group would say, bull crap. <laughs> Only they said something else, but I'm sure. And, uh, and so another member of the group would say, what is it you love more than anything? And the new newcomer would say, well, I love my children more than anything. And in unison, they would go, bull crap. And they kept this up, asking him the same question over and over until finally they asked him, what do you love more than anything? And he said, I love alcohol more than anything. At which point, the members of the group put their arms around him lovingly and he began to cry. And Finley pointed out that at that moment of honesty and making himself truly vulnerable and deeply known, healing began. Now that, I think, that story, more than, he told so many great stories, but that was the story that Finley told that just reminded me of this place. Now as far as I know, we don't have a bullcrap ritual. <laughs> But, but we do, we do know here that it is when we are willing to make ourselves vulnerable, invite others into our struggle, our, our, our real struggle, that grace breaks in and healing begins. We know that. And I would say that's part of what's at the heart of this place. You've heard it more eloquently from John, and you will hear it from others. But, but I think that is what's at the heart of this place. Some of you have heard me tell the story maybe more times than one about um, a, a member who wanted me to, to visit him at his workplace. So I went there during lunch and he introduced me to all the people and, and then he's walking me to my car and, and um, I said, wow, everyone really seems to love you at your job. And he said, yeah, but it doesn't mean anything. And I said, what? And he said, they don't know me. They don't know where I struggle. They don't even know 
that I'm a recovering addict. Something as fundamental as that. I think when we are loved by someone who doesn't really know us or where we struggle, the healing power is limited. But when we are loved by someone who knows and understands our brokenness and our limitations and our struggle, and yet they love us in that just as we are, that's powerful. And it's that kind of loving and knowing combination that is at the heart of Recovery Cafe. Uh, we, we, our recovery circle structure, most, many of you know because you lead recovery circles, recovery circle, but our, our, the structure that holds that kind of loving and knowing is called our recovery circle. And what happens in those circles reverberates throughout the cafe. So lately I've been thinking, uh, maybe it's because Valentine's Day is coming, uh, although that's not a huge holiday for me. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but lately, uh, maybe I'm hoping it will be. <laughs> Sky, you can tell Bernie I said that. Um, but lately I've been, I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, we talk a lot about being a loving community. I've been thinking about how do we become more loving. And, and I wanted to just remind us of three things that, that might help us become more loving. Um, first of all, I think it helps if we can admit to ourselves that we are still amateurs at loving. That on a scale of one to ten, with ten being complete love for our enemies. Some of us are at about four struggling to love our in-laws. <laughs> I know you love your mother. <laughs> or maybe our daughter's boyfriends. <laughs> Man friends. <laughs> That's why we need a contemplative practice to reconnect us daily with the wellspring of love within us and to let that love flow through us as us. That's, that's something, for years I've been listening to James Finley tapes. And I, admit, I am a, a, a James Finley groupie. And one of the things he says that's so striking to me is that divine love wants to manifest itself, his or herself, through us as us. That's an amazing thing. Second uh, reminder to those of us who hope, who want to grow more loving is um, most of us don't like to make ourselves vulnerable. So we guard and protect our hearts in a number of ways, but that only wins us false security, isolation, and loneliness. There is an epidemic of loneliness in our country. Our only true security is in loving freely extravagantly, indiscriminately, sacrificially. Our only true security is in vulnerability. So we need to hold our noses and jump more fully into the pool of vulnerability. I know some of you have read, read this article because I think it was in the Seattle paper last, last week. But um, a, a David Brooks, in a recent article, relayed the story of a group of American soldiers who were captured by the Nazis in World War II. Did any of you read this? Yes. Um, the head of the German prison camp ordered all the American soldiers who were Jewish to step forward. 
and a, an American master sergeant named Roddy Edmonds immediately ordered all his men, all his men, to step forward. The Nazi held a gun to his head and he said, all these soldiers can't be Jewish. And the master sergeant calmly replied, we are all Jews. Rather than execute the, all the American soldiers, the Nazi backed it down. Third reminder to those of us who want to grow more loving, we don't grow in the art of loving simply by wanting to be more loving, although that's a great place to start. We grow more loving by practicing very intentionally, day in and day out, looking for that place of love that pearl of great price in every single person we meet. Especially in those who we find most difficult. And for some of us, the person we find most difficult is the person who looks back at us from our bathroom mirror. I think Michael Jackson wrote a song about that. <laughs> <laughs> David's going to do the moonwalk later. In short, um, what love is what we practice here. And it is practice. Love is what we practice here at Recovery Cafe. Looking for the pearl of great price in every person who walks through the door is what we practice here. And everyone in this room, I mean everyone in this room, has participated in that practice which has nurtured the soul of this place. This place did not become this way just by magic and wishing it to be this way. Recovery Cafe simply would not be the healing place that it is without each one of you here today. Before closing, I just want to uh, give you an update on a couple of really exciting things that are happening. First, a consulting firm was commissioned to do a study of the current state of mental health in King County and then to present their findings to the uh, King County officials. What they told King County, uh, they told them several things needed to happen. But one of the things they told, them, told the officials um, that needed to happen in King County is that there, need to be, there needs to be more recovery cafes here. So that, that, was very, that was very encouraging. And, and we are hopeful that one day, and we're not sure exactly how it will happen, but we're hopeful that one day King County will help us open uh, another recovery cafe in North and the recovery cafe in South Seattle in the places that they've identified as places of greatest need. Another exciting development is that on June 7th and 8th, we will have our first two-day training for a cohort of groups who are seeking to replicate this model in their towns. Now, we don't know how many are going to join the cohort. We've, we've had three days called Come and See Days where people have come to learn have, have an introduction, they've been introduced to the model, and we don't know how many are going to commit to being in the, the cohort, but we believe it will be at least five groups. And we are really excited. Uh, we had one of the, Maddie's been instrumental in, in um, 
organizing these come and see days and and um, at, at our last come and see day this lovely man from Tacoma who is committed to being a part of replicating the model in Tacoma at the end of the day he said you know parents watch their kids I mean sorry kids watch their parents I guess it kind of goes both ways but 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 what he said was kids um, watch their parents and then imitate them and he said I want you to know that we in Tacoma have been watching you guys in Seattle and we've been watching not just how the cafes why you know how you made such a beautiful place we've been watching the way your team works together and he said we are very moved and very inspired and I just want you to know that we consider all of you a part of this team. Um, you help make this place worthy of replication. All of you in your own way have stepped forward in solidarity with those who are suffering on our streets. By your participation, you have said in solidarity with our members, we are all homeless. We are all mentally anguished. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts.